All right. Thanks for tuning into the Sheet Metal Shaping Podcast, where we discuss the pursuit of sheet metal shaping education through traditional coach building techniques. My guest today on the show, the one and only the man, Mr. Bill Tremblay. What's up? Hi, how are you? I'm so excited to have you here. This is great. I yeah, see your Instagram stuff all the time, and I thought, gosh, got to get this guy on. <laughs> well, thank you very much. So, yeah, looking <laughs> yeah. forward to the show. So It was fun. It was uh, Pat Rubaker. I had him on the show, and and he's like, I, I, you know, I, I always ask the guests, is there anybody else that you think would be a good fit for the show? And he's like, oh, you got to have Bill on. You got to reach out. So here we are. I'm glad you can make it. Yeah, Pat's a good guy, and uh, he's a smart person to be around. So he's a lot for of sure. fun. So, for yeah. sure. So for today's show, we're going to talk all about aircraft. I've had a lot of sheet metal shapers um, on talking about sculpture or art, or uh, automotive related. This one, let's talk planes. Let's talk aircraft. I want to talk about uh, all the things that may be the same or maybe different about something that flies in the sky as opposed to, as opposed to rolling down the road. So uh, you're the man. I'm excited yeah. for this. <laughs> well, uh, the airplane world, it's, uh, you know, it's the second most regulated industry next to the use of nuclear power. So we got a, a, lot, a couple more rules to play with or follow yeah. than maybe the car stuff, but like That's anything, cool. you can learn it and work your way through it. So, yeah. um, so there's a lot more rules and regulations involved and things to consider when making parts, but like anything else, you learn the processes and you follow it. So, Hello. um, yeah, Hello. we can dive into how much that is or how I got started, uh, don't know exactly which direction you would want to take it, but yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's start there. So tell the folks a bit about yourself. Uh, for me, my background is actually machining. So, uh, when I was in high school, my older brother was a machinist and I wanted to keep up with him. So, uh, <laughs> when I was still in high school, I was offered an apprenticeship to be a machinist and right out of school and four years later became a journeyman machinist. The thing was though, is I was an airplane guy. So I'd leave work and go hang out at the airport, like an airport bum and That's got funny. involved with a airplane restoration, a World War II bomber restoration. Mm -hmm. And uh, for there, what happened was, is people would look at it and go, hey, you know, you know how to make stuff. Can you help with that? It being a machinist. So <laughs> yeah. uh, I was doing both. So I'd work all day and then leave, go hang out at the airport and started making stuff mainly with, in the beginning was tools. And then, well, we need parts that are repaired. Can you do that? Or machined or whatever. So, and that's how I was doing it. Eventually I got my pilot license and I got my mechanics license, which is an A and P license. Yeah. And then, in that was back in the early nineties. And, uh, in 2001, the company I was working for, the owner had fallen ill and it just seemed like a good time. So I went out on my own and started my own business. And two years later, my brother came in full time working for us. And now we own the room own the business together. Yeah. And then his son got into it. So now Tony's working for us and he's doing <laughs> awesome. Nice. And so mainly what we do mostly was machining work. And that's what we were known for, like a job shop environment. Yeah. And the machining was going great. And then you have a customer come along and go, Hey, can you weld this? And it's like, well, we do a lot of welding. So then it was start pushing into more of the airplane welding stuff. And then it was, hey, you know, seeing you can do machine and weld, can you stamp, make like basic stamping dies? So then we'd start stamping aluminum parts. Then it was, oh, hey, you know, that's cool and all. Can you start metal shaping parts? <laughs> and that's how the kind of the progression goes. And, yeah. and because of my manufacturing background and the airplane background, I'm able to speak the language, you know, that a lot of restoration shops are they do awesome work and they got awesome mechanics, but they don't necessarily have a, a manufacturing background. Right. So then we're able to tie that together to be able to make it so it's good quality, airworthy parts. And yeah. originally it was machining and then, you know, welding and then before you know it, the metal shaping aspect of it. It's interesting you say speak the language because, I mean, speaking the language of multiple like it's the same, you know, it's the same industry, metal working in effect. But I mean, to be able to speak machining and welding and manufacturing and, you know, just the way that things work, um, right. that's huge. That's huge. You can advise people and say, you know what, maybe do it this way, not that way, because I've had an experience in the past. You know, you could you could say that and it's just so natural and so fluent. Right, right. Exactly. Um, 
like for us, we were accustomed, like if we needed something hard chrome plated, I know the companies that do that. Yeah. And what data and information will they need? Well, the mechanic who's doing the repair work might not even know that the chrome plater is actually here in Milwaukee. And, <laughs> and that then is where we fill that gap and be able to go, okay. And then to be able to make it so that they have the information and the data that they need to make it legal. You know, mm. if it's a standard certified category airplane, then there's more paperwork that's involved and in, in possible FAA involvement. And because I have both of those backgrounds, I understand it. So I'm able to go, OK, yeah, here's the process. Here's what I think you're going to need. Do you agree and work with them so that that way we can salvage the parts that are out there? So a lot of what I do is the vintage airplanes or Warbird airplanes. Mm. Um, but I do get involved with modern stuff as well. It all depends on where the need is and and um, if there's help that that they need, then that's the service that we'll provide. So, so let's yeah. let's go there. Let's talk about restoration versus um, you know new construction or something modern. Um, when we're going down the restoration path, let's start with that. Okay. When somebody says, "I want to restore an airplane," where do they start? What does that mean? Uh, it, it's similar to a car, right? And and all the the community is small. Aviation is small, but then the vintage and warbird movement of it is a lot smaller. And so you got to start with buying the airplane and then, and it's like buying an old car. And then it's finding the people that know what they're doing to be able to rebuild it and restore it. And what I provide is, is not necessarily the restoration. It's making the parts for the restoration shops. Right. And, um, and that seems to work well for us. We, I really love restoration work. But we're so busy and pulled in so many directions. I, I don't. I can't dedicate the time to it, you know. And we like our size of our company. We like it on the smaller side. It, you know, yeah. works well for us for the last twenty some odd years that we've been doing it. <laughs> twenty three years now. So, yeah, that's good. That's yeah. good. It's interesting. Bigger isn't always better. Some people think that bigger is better, smaller is better. I mean, really, at the end of the day, it's what works for you. Like, what makes you happy? What makes you tick? Yeah, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I, I think if and I, I think this is true of a lot of shops and metal shapers like us. If real businessmen saw how we'd run a business, they'd fire us. You know, they'd look <laughs> at it like, what are you doing? You know, why don't you triple your size? And why don't you have a bank full of all this equipment and everything yeah. else? And it's like, well, you know, we're just happy the way it works. And, and uh, we've been doing it all this time. We don't advertise and we never have a slow day. I, I, yeah. I think we're doing okay. <laughs> That's good. That's yeah. really good. So when you like when you go and you're you're starting some of these restorations, I mean, what's the most common request from some of these people who are doing the work if you're supplying them with parts? A lot of what wears out on airplanes is actually landing gear components. You know, that's where all the abuse is. So that's where we started out doing a lot of the machining work was landing gear kind of components. Um where we're getting into now with the metal shaping aspect of it is uh, parts that will suffer from fatigue cracking over, you know, a lot of the airplanes are 80 plus years old now yeah. that I'm involved in <laughs> and dents and, and uh, cracks and bad weld repairs and stuff like that. And uh, so that those would be metal shaped parts where it's just easier to make them new. Yeah. And uh, so we're doing that. And then it all depends on whether it's a structural application or not, you know, so there's different materials that are used and sure. a lot more what's, that you have to understand. When you're doing that, I mean, what's the most common type of type of fatigue? Is it vibration? Uh, it's most of the time it's uh, vibration or corrosion. Mm -hmm. So uh, it would be mostly the damage that you would see. Uh, denting is well, depending on the material that it was made out of. So, um, yeah, it, it's and then it also too a lot of uh, with the warbirds. If the airplanes, because they hold such high value nowadays, like a Corsair or a Mustang, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that if they're crashed, you know, even if it's a simple landing accident, they're worthwhile to be fixed. And mm -hmm. and so there, then you have to get creative on being able to build the new parts to be able to repair the damage that caused from sliding down a runway so yeah yeah well I, I, you know it's funny because i would have never thought 
I know that I'm more, I know more about cars than I do about planes. And sure. especially on cars, um, you think, okay, like how much is it to restore this car and what is the car worth when it's done? And does it make sense to restore the thing based on economics, right? Right. But I never would have put two and two together on aircraft, but it, it still holds true. Like some things never change. It's just the principles. Exactly. Exactly. And, and some airplanes are not worth it to be restored, right? Because you never get the money out of it. Sure. But then you have passion and, and right. people maybe with disposable income and you need that in this world too. Just like you do with cars where sometimes it doesn't make financial sense, but it's yeah. saved for the world. So then it's right. that individual is worth it to you know invest into it and then you can find the craftsman to do the work. Absolutely. So, do, you, yeah. do you find there's more, uh, there's more passion projects out there than stuff with economic viability or do you think it's split down the middle? I think it's it's relatively split down the middle, hmm. you know, where the the higher end projects, or they're willing to invest more into them. Uh, those have generally the people who can afford the funds to be able to do that. So, but then you also have a guy that he has enough money to afford one airplane, and it's a smaller airplane, and it needs parts made too. So, yeah. um, you know, it's actually quite similar to the car world. It's just maybe sometimes a little bit different numbers that we might be talking about financially, but yeah. even that to a certain extent, you know, if it's a, a single or a two seat airplane, it's still a 30 or $40,000 airplane. It's not a $3 million airplane. So you, <laughs> you can't, you know, it's, it's similar, you know, you yeah. got Bugatti prices and you got Chevy Nova prices. That's right. Are we taking Warbird airplanes through uh, Barrett Jackson or what's going on? Here? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, yeah. uh, the, the, you know, the Pebble Beach judging and all that stuff, we have that as well. There's the sure. Oshkosh show up in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, the yep. world's largest air show. And there's judging that goes on there. I'm one of the Warbird judges up there. So, ah, very cool. Yeah, very this cool. will be my 25th year as a Warbird judge. So. Oh, nice. nice. Yeah. Hey, is there an ownership for an airplane in the same way you'd transfer ownership for a car, like a, a title? Oh, yeah. 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 There's a, it's a federal, they call it a registration. It's, uh, but it's like a title. Yeah. yeah. And you have yeah. to transfer it from owner to owner. And uh, there's an airworthiness certificate that goes with it, which is a document deemed that this airplane is airworthy. And, yeah. and then that maintenance has to go into it to maintain that. So, yeah, there's, there's more steps to it, obviously, than a car. Yeah. So then when you're manufacturing parts, let's say you're repairing a wing or a, a fairing or, you know, an engine right. cowl or something like that. Let's talk about the certification to make sure that these things can actually fly and not fall from the sky. So what, what does a, what does shaping an aircraft part look like versus if that same part were on a car, like what, what changes, what's the difference? Uh, so for us, generally a lot of the manuals are available and a lot of the factory blueprints are available for military airplanes. Mm -hmm. So if it's a fairing, like I have a, B-17 bomber oil cooler inlets that I got to make. Well, I was able to get the original Boeing drawings for that. So wow. now I know what grade was used. I know what material thicknesses were used and stuff like that. So now I'm just reproducing it in accordance with the drawing. Right. And so that makes that aspect easier. Um, when it comes to certification, it depends on how the airplane is, is certified. So if it's standard category, like a modern day Cessna or a Boeing, uh, you know, a Boeing, uh, 737, uh, those are in, at a category where, uh, there's processes that you would have to show conformance to the design that this part is the same as that. Mm. And uh, we can do that. And we've done that many times. If the airplanes are the vintage airplanes, like a Warbird, a lot of those airplanes fall into what's called an experimental category. Oh. So in experimental category, you still want to make the part so it's airworthy. <laughs> right. Um, you know, because of what it's doing. Sure. Yeah. Uh, um, but the paperwork and the legality of it, as far as the FAA is concerned, changes. So it actually makes that process a little bit easier. So we still provide the information and the data and, you know, and I still get the drawings and I still try to use the same kind of materials and everything else because, you know, we can't have this thing coming apart in flight. Yeah. And um, but as far as the legality, as far as the government goes, it, it's in a different category. So it allows that to give you more leeway. Basically. And then what if you don't what if you don't have any of that stuff? 
What if you can't so find drawings? You can't find blueprints. You can't find any historical references to say, yeah, this was made with 14 yeah. gauge aluminum or something. You know, like, how do you know? What yeah. You so, so what we do is we reverse engineer it. So we take, uh, and I've done this a number of times, uh, take a piece of sample material and send it to a local metallurgy company. Hmm. And for $120, they'll tell me what the material grade was. Really? And then from there, I can determine then that, oh, okay, well, this piece was made from uh, 2024, let's say, mm -hmm. as aluminum, which is a very common aircraft grade, but now I know it. Yeah. And then the only way for me to shape that is I got to shape it in 2024. Oh, so it has to be in an annealed state. Right. And then once it's shaped, then I have to heat treat it and they'll temper it to a T4 condition. And, and so, but I can figure out those steps. And then what we do is we work directly with the owner or the restoration shop to go, this is our thought process. Do you see it the same way? And, and, and work from it that way. And then I have several engineers that I know that, uh, and metallurgists that I know that I can also call them and go, this is how I see this. And this is how I calculated my numbers and everything else. Am I missing something? Mm -hmm. You know, and they go, no, yeah. Or, you know, maybe you should think of it this way or something like that. And because the community is also small, uh, yeah. there are also other restoration shops that you can call and go, hey, this is the problem I got. This is what I was thinking and run it by them. And it's the great thing with the small community is and you know a lot of people in this world to be able to help <laughs> with that. So, yeah. you know, there is a process. You just got to follow the process. Yeah. You know? How much of this requires an engineered stamp? versus doing the historical referencing as you speak? The in, uh, the engineering stamp would be much more if it was a standard category, modern day kind of an airplane, depending on how it was certified. Um, but then we have, there's they're called DERs, which is Designated Engineering Representatives, and that's their job. And you can hire them and you, you submit them with a packet and go, this is the problem, this is the part, this is how I'm making it materials used and do you agree and they go okay and they they're the ones then that would stamp it and give you the mm -hmm. approval and you can even do that with the faa themselves the faa has an engineering department it's just that they uh and they're great to deal with but they're a little bit understaffed so sometimes they push you just go to a der to get the job done right <laughs> but you know and i've worked with the faa and had a a great relationship with them and when I need it to. So, yeah, it, it's the only thing we don't ever want to do is say, I think it's okay. <laughs> you know, I think is the equivalent to a guess, you know. Did I no, tighten that screw? Did I tighten that? <laughs> I think it's okay. Yeah, I think it's okay. <laughs> right. Yeah, we want to be a little bit more uh, co uh, confident in that decision than, uh, than yeah. I think it'll be okay. Let's talk about metal grades. So you'd mentioned 2024. How many different metal grades of aluminum would be common on an aircraft? There is uh, six grades. It would be the most common. So you'd have 1100, 3003, 5052, mm -hmm. and those would be an H material side. And then you have 2024, 6061, and 7075, which is on the T side. Uh -huh. And the differences between H's and T's is H materials can only be made hardened by work hardening. You got to, or the raw process, where T materials, you have to heat treat them. You got, they have to go into an oven. Mm. And generally, 2024 and 7075 are structural materials. Right. So that's what the spars and wing ribs and wing skins are mainly made out of. And and some of the fairings and some of the cowlings, some of the more compound shapes will be 2024. Um, but then you'll find like 3003 aluminum for fairings. That's a non-structural application yeah. and stuff like that. So. And then in material thicknesses, we'll range anywhere from about 20 thousandths up to 100 thousandths. Mm -hmm. And probably the most common material thickness I work in is 40 thousandths. Really? So, yeah. Weight so matters, right? It's, it matters. Yeah. <laughs> weight, weight matters. And, <laughs> and uh, so it makes it a challenge shaping because uh, the shaping industry, for however small it is, is mostly set up for the automotive world. So the tools are set up for shaping in steel. Yeah. And third or sixty thousand three double oh three aluminum is what you know all the coach builders would use. Yeah. So you you know, I talk to them about tool marking and they go, Well, you just grind it. And you go, Yeah, but I 
not on the plane. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can't, you know, so yeah. uh, it's a different world for me in that regard. Um, so what, what changes in terms of tooling? So, I mean, you're like, you're not, are you saying you're not going with a shrinker stretcher on a piece of aluminum and putting teeth marks in it and stuff like that for aircraft components? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So like yeah. for me, I have a Eckhold with a plastic Nomar dies yeah. for shrinking. And then in my power hammer, I have uh, plastic thumbnail dies and plastic dies in my CP plenishing hammer. Yeah. Uh, the only real steel on steel dies I use is if I'm stretching in the power hammer. Oh. Um uh, or otherwise I'm building most of my parts now with plastic tooling, even reform dies in a pole max are I'm using plastic tooling just to prevent tool marking yeah. because of the damage that it causes. And that causes all these rippling effects in the aviation world that would make a part that looks beautiful, but you wouldn't find a mechanic willing to bolt it on because to them it has damage to it. So it's interesting. A, yeah. It's a lot more of a challenge in that regard. So, is some of that visual or is it x-rayed or how does that, like, how would you, how would you tell if, okay, you make a component, you made it with the wrong tooling, somebody grounded or did something and you can't really tell, um, from the eye. I mean, would you be x-raying these parts before they go on for stress factors or? Um, generally it's, it's stuff that doesn't need to be x-rayed. Um, the only time that that would come into effect is if it was a highly structural piece and generally in higher speed aircraft, you'll find it in jet stuff and and or pressurized cabins and stuff like that um in the world that we play in you don't so um you we ndt to an extent but they're relying a lot on the builders not to that are supposed to know what they're doing not to be <laughs> grinding out hammer marks don't screw yeah. it up yeah right <laughs> that's the point yeah don't do right. it <laughs> Well, and, and for us, uh, you know, uh, I got to be careful about like uh, having putting scratches in the aluminum because it's yeah. a stress riser and cause a crack. Yeah. If the aluminum was L-cladded, which a lot of 2024 is, L-cladding is a coating of pure aluminum that's applied to the surface mm -hmm. to prevent corrosion. Right. Well, if it's scratched through the L-clad, well, then it'll you created a cap pathway for corrosion. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, these basic kinds of things that a car guy might not worry about becomes an issue with us and then for us a basic standard that we use like if we found a, a part and it had corrosion on it is that we can grind away up to 10 percent of the base material is a, is a generic basic standard so if it's a 40 thousand skin that's four thousandths of an inch that's the thickness of a piece of paper right so if i put hammer marks in it I'm going to be taking away more than 4,000, <laughs> you know, so therefore then I, I can't afford that. And that's even, I have to be careful when shaping. I, I can't, like if I'm building a wickedly large reverse curve and I'm yeah. stretching the edge. You thin that you, out and it cracks and where yeah. you go. Yeah. Well, and I, I, I can't thin it out into oblivion and go, it's a 40 thousandths in the center, but 10 thousandths at the edge. Yeah. You know, so that it makes the shaping more challenging. So how do you way. overcome that? How do you overcome that? Because I mean, lots of people have that problem on a reverse. They're feeding it through the wheel or they're feeding it through the hammer or they're doing it with the hammer dolly and they're taking that edge and they're thinning it right out. It's, it's, you know, it's basically knife edge. And by the time it gets on a car or on some other piece of art, um, it's too right. thin. It fails, right? right how right. do you guys prevent that? Uh, how I go about it is, is if I have the original piece is I dimensionally measure it be mm -hmm. before I make my part. And the benefit with that is it tells me where they stretched it. Ah. You know, and, and then did they shrink it in the center? And I and I have a way in the power hammer where I can actually shrink the center of a reverse. And that will give me a lot of the shape. And then by knowing where they stretched it, where it went, got thin, yeah. then I can do the same thing. And then there, too, is if I can measure it and go, well, it's it's seven thousandths thinner at the edge. As long as my piece doesn't go more than that, well, then I'm okay with it, right? If, that's right. you know, if, if Boeing was good with it, then I'm good with it too. It's, that's right, yeah. To look at it. So it's a way for me to, to uh, is it to cheat or to do it in an educated way is to measure how did they do it and mirror that. Yeah, we chalk that one up to intelligence for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's how what I like. Your, Go ahead. How do you do your shrinking with the power hammer in the middle? Uh, there's a, there was a book I found and it, it's written by a, uh, guy from Finland and, uh, I always murder his name. 
uh, but it, it, he was a tinsmith guy and he, yeah. and he, and he wrote this book and it's called an anti-clastic curve and it's how they shrink when they would build uh, silverwork. Mm -hmm. And it, it actually uh, contains the edges and, and allows you to shrink the center of a reverse An anti-clastic is what we call a reverse curve. Right. And um, it's stuff I could post pictures of. I, I posted it from time to time. Mm -hmm. And um, all I did was is just uh, scale it up and built the dies in a power hammer so I could replicate the same thing of what they're doing with a stake in a, in a mallet building mm -hmm. silverwork. So the concept's the same. I just put power to it is all I did. Can you describe how the dies hit or how the contact pattern actually functions? Uh, so it, the lower die is just a cutout, a half round, and mm -hmm. the upper die hits in the middle, but uh, cross to the lower die, it, it hits like this. Yep. And so it, it bridges, uh, it, the edges of the panel are supported and the center is hollow. And because of that, uh, when you're pushing down on the panel, uh, a spine will develop in the center and then you're shrinking that spine. It's in essence tuck shrinking it in the center of a panel. Uh, Ray Shalene had did a similar video about this a number of years ago. Um, he was using a larger diameter piece of pipe, yeah. but the, the concept is very similar. So it, it's, uh, it, and it does work. It allows me to gain material thickness. And, you know, I'd rather take a thicker panel and put it on an airplane than putting a thinner one on. So sure. and that's, that allows that to happen. So, and it, and it works well. Yeah, a lot of people you show them it and they go, that ain't gonna work. I don't know, how does it work? And then you show them and then they then they get it. So the lights go off. So isn't that the whole point of the industry? Is to to evolve and grow and learn something new from somebody else and, and yeah. you're like, you know what, I don't think that's gonna work. And then you go and you do it and it does work and they go, Oh yeah, you were right. Like I think that's just amazing. Everybody can learn from each other. Right. And I, I think in this industry, in metal shaping, there's no like a uh, trade school down the street that you can go to. A lot of it is transfer of information between me and you or whatever and going, Hey, I got this problem. What do you think? Yeah. And it's a much more of a, of a smaller community. It's extremely small community when you think about it. I mean, yeah. how many metal shapers are out there it's, <laughs> it, it, all combined There's not that many people. So, it's and it's, it works well for everybody. The, the, when everybody's willing to share the information. So, yeah. Do you, do you find that too? Like the, it's a pretty open community. I mean, everybody's generally pretty happy with each other. Oh yeah. 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 I, I, I found that to be very much true that, uh, uh, there's a lot of people that have good knowledge and a passion and, and willing to share it. And, uh, uh, it's just for me, cause I'm, I'm coming in from the airplane aspect. It's like, share me your information and then I'll figure out how to get that to work for the airplane stuff but that's right yeah, yeah i i can't quite be as aggressive as as they might be on something but yeah i'll i'll, I'll give me the concept and i'll make it work for what i'm doing yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. if somebody wanted to get started shaping material for aircraft specifically what do you think the the most difficult part is of getting into that industry and where do you think people should learn from um i would think the best thing to do would be is to get involved with a bigger airplane restoration shops. Um, how many of them are out there? They're not that many that you would think. You know, there's maybe one or two a state and maybe yeah. not even that. Um, but at least then it would give them the exposure of understanding airplanes in, in that whole mentality of uh, what is legal, what is not, the processes and all of that. And then they do metal shaping to an extent, uh, maybe not quite to what I'm doing. This is, a, you know, relatively specialized. Not all the shops have English wheels or power hammers, but um, once they have that aspect, then it would be to do basically what I did and was to seek out people who are willing to share that information, whether it's from other airplane guys like me or going into the car world and, and, finding the car guys and then taking what you learn and applying it to this craft. Sure. You know, and, and I'm, I'm sure that's kind of how artists might do it if they're in the metal shaping as well or, or whatever. It's kind of how mm -hmm. we maybe all do it, I suppose. Do you find a lot of people drag some bad habits into the aircraft industry from automotive because the shaping is kind of the same, but kind of different too? 
Yeah, I, I find that to be true. And um, uh, it's like they always have the best intention and uh, everything. But the, there's a reason why the, the rules and the regulations come out from something. And usually <laughs> that's because bad things happened. And, right. and so um, I'm willing to help them and, and give them the information, whatever it would be, to try to make it so that uh, we don't get more regulation that comes out. Of it, I guess. You know. Do it right to keep it easy for everybody. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's just it. If you can't make the part out of 2024, then just don't make the part. Don't you make know. The part. Yeah. Yeah. You know. It, Where did you learn from? Uh, for me, when when I we were starting to get asked to do the metal shaping stuff, the the only thing I knew of metal shaping is I thought it was awesome, but I only thought everything was built on English wheels, right? <laughs> That's all you would ever see, you know, right. the old airplane videos and stuff were English wheels. So I contacted Peter Thomasini. He was stateside at that time, and he was holding class in Nashville, and then the following year, up in Minneapolis. And I took his class twice and I bought mm -hmm. an English wheel. I bought his English wheel, his cast wheel. Yeah. And that's what I was using to build parts. I, I thought it was, it was awesome. Um, and my skill levels were progressing and everything else. The challenge is, is a lot of my parts are relatively small, like 24 inch square or smaller right. and very tight radius. Like, yep. Yeah, um, I did a wing fillet that had a three quarter inch radius on one end and a 12 inch radius on the other. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it says tapering reverse curve. Uh -huh. Well, that's hard to get an English wheel. So yeah. um, I custom machined an upper die for my English wheel. that's like a five inch diameter. Be able to help me to get into those spots. Um, but I had a CP plenishing hammer. The a good friend of mine gave me and it's on permanent loan here. And I was building a lot of parts with that. Yeah. and shaping with a plenishing hammer and i wanted to continue my education so i went and saw faye butler and mm -hmm. and faye had me take his three-day class and he's a power hammer guy and i was using yeah. his yoders and and uh i left faye's class came home and and found a number two pettingill an original yep and i bought that and i needed to rebuild it it was pretty tired and i had to machine all the dies for it and became a power hammer guy. It's, <laughs> it's just a different way and mentality of shaping, I think. And it's very intuitive. I think it's a lot easier. Sure. And then uh, the following year, I spent a week with Faye and we did, that was just a one-on-one -on -one class. And that was low crown panels and high crown panels. And then the following year, I spent another week with them only doing reverse curves. Mm -hmm. You know, and when you think about low crown, high crown reverses is the bulk of what shaping is other than adjusting form and panels. So, sure. um, and that took and catapulted my skill level, you know, panels before where I could get away with it and make it out of, uh, two pieces and weld them together, you know, now like complex, uh, nose bowls and wheel pants. I make that all out of one piece now. I, I don't yeah. need to be welding them together anymore. So it, I get a higher quality part and, and I think it, power hammer use is a lot more intuitive. It was easier for me to learn, I thought, than using an English wheel. So my hat's off to guys that are awesome wheel guys like Peter or Jeff Moss and Kevin Mason. I mean, those guys, those guys are one hell of good metal shapers and <laughs> Pat Brewraker and, and stuff like that. And yep. I tried and tried and tried. And I think I understand the concept, but it, it was always a challenge for me, I thought. Yeah. Um, it seemed like in a hammer, if I had a vision in my head of what I wanted the part to look like, when I'd run it through the hammer, I would get what I would envision. Hmm. If I was wheeling the panel, I had an envision and an idea of what I wanted. When I'd run it through the wheel, I wouldn't always get what I thought I would get. Ah. And it was, uh, I found that to be frustrating. And you think, <laughs> well, both of them are stretching machines. Right, right. Um but it, it just, I think the way that uh, when it goes through the wheel, how the panel curls, and I understand that's part of the form of it and whatever, but it just mm -hmm. seemed to be like it was longer to learn that process. You yeah. know, in a hammer, if I see a low spot, I go to the low spot and I push it up. <laughs> yeah. You know, English wheels, sometimes you go to the low, sometimes you don't. To this <laughs> day, no one's told me why that <laughs> works one way or the other, but it's true. And, and, so uh, once I be started getting into power hammer work, that's 
that was the direction I really wanted to go. And it's easier for me to get into the tighter radius parts and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, I think that speaks to education in general. It almost doesn't even matter the industry, but like if you learn something from somebody else that makes you more proficient at what you do, you would only hope that somebody has a better way than you do because that's how you grow, right? That's how right. you get better. If everybody's trying to do it the same way, you know, a, a piece of granite and a chisel, well, like, you know, not, <laughs> nothing evolves. What are we doing here, right? Right, exactly. It, and I, people ask me all the time about, you know, they see what I'm doing and the pathway I took. And I tell them, it's amazing to me how many people will buy a $20,000 power hammer, but not invest in a $3,000 educational or yeah. to use it. Can somebody like, show me how to plug this thing in. Uh, yeah, well, like, <laughs> right. You know, yeah. wouldn't that be the better choice? And so, right. And can we all learn it? Yeah. But look at the time savings I had by getting instruction from Peter and, and Faye and, and yeah. you know, the guys at Metal Meets and stuff like that to be able to uh, speed along the process of learning where I'm building complex airworthy parts and, you know, customers are happy. And, and I, I feel good that it's a, indeed a good airworthy part. It, there's no yeah. compromise to it. And yeah. That's, I think, the most important thing is I go home and I sleep just fine at night. You know, that's good. That's right? good. <laughs> you know, that's what we all want. So at least as for we, the airplane world. As we wind this down, you were mentioning uh, just before we jumped on, you were talking about uh, an upcoming metal meet that's taking yeah. place. What's going on there? Yeah. So uh, there is the spring metal meet. It's the Route 56 metal meet. It's uh, hosted by Dan Pate and his, his wife, Luann. They're up in Denison, Minnesota. And the dates are May 3rd, 4th, and 5th of this year. Uh, Dan's place is about 30 miles south of Minneapolis, so people could fly into the airport up there and arrange to get picked up. And uh, metal meets are, are awesome. I learned a lot from a metal meet, and I've developed a lot of really good close friends from it, you know, because it's like-minded mentality of people. And it's that exchange of knowledge that is and it's a free event you know we recommend to have donations to be able to help cover expenses but for the amount of information that's exchanged it, it's just hard to beat and there's a couple of them that go on throughout the year um, but it's it's anybody also that wants to really kind of get into this in the metal shaping whether it's artwork airplanes or cars or gas tanks for motorcycles or whatever i think metal meets would be a benefit also too if you wanted to learn like should I go buy a $40,000 Eckhold machine? Well, up there, there's one you can try and use and decide, is this for you or maybe, maybe not, you know, <laughs> and a, well, then there's a power hammer and English wheel and then mm -hmm. that exchange of ideas as well. So there's seminars that get put on. And then if you wanted to bring a project, uh, you could do that as well. So we recommend uh, there's a post on all metal shaping, uh, the forum about it. Uh, people can contact me about it. Um, there's a couple of uh, metal shaping pages on Facebook where it's been posted, but um, I think between you, me, and all metal shaping, if people are interested, we can get them the information. And we recommend everyone contact Dan because he's hosting it. He's he needs to know. Yeah. <laughs> well, he needs to know how many people are showing up to be at his house and how many hot dogs he's supposed to buy and <laughs> you know all that kind of stuff. So we want good. You don't get many. Numbers. You don't get many drop-ins. Hey, hey, I heard you have an echo machine. I was around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, I tell him he's like a drug dealer. Every time I yeah. go up there for a long time, I had to go buy my next piece of equipment That's because he, yeah. he had all the stuff. And and yeah. that way, then I was like, hmm. Yeah, I guess I need to buy one of these. So that's funny. Yeah. Well, this, this has been fun. I mean, I love your I love your approach to metal shaping and also um, not just for metal shaping in general, but aircraft specific. Like I think you're very intuitive with the way that you're approaching the way that the material moves and you're saying, hey, you know, if I don't know, let me go find somebody that does know. And the fact that you can find the balance between does it need to be engineered or do we need to reverse engineer and just reproduce what somebody has already figured out? Like, I think right. that's, that's, that's really cool. And the fact that you can parlay that into information for the masses here is, uh, is pretty cool. So for me to you, thank you so much for being on the show. Wow. Uh, where can people find out more about you and what you got going on? Uh, <laughs> there's only two places on Facebook under William Tremblay and on Instagram under William Tremblay. <laughs> it's the only places we post and, and, uh, uh, they can follow me there on Instagram. I post pictures, of a lot of the work I do, uh, some of it. And then on Facebook, I post on it. There's an aviation sheet metal page and I, I post the work that I do on there. Um, but yeah, reach out for me 
through there and and then make it happen. So, yeah. Fantastic. Bill Trombley, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for tuning into the Sheet Metal Shaper podcast. Don't forget to like, share, follow, and subscribe. And if you liked it, tell a friend. We'll see great. you on the next episode. Thanks for having me on. It was a great time.